Thank you, Ethan. It's a, a pleasure to uh, kind of help wrap the morning up. So we have a very micro timing with all the speakers. I was supposed to start at 11.10. It's 11.11. They've done a great job. So I'll only stretch this next 20 minutes into 45 for you. So, so my job uh, is to help clean up a lot of areas and topics. So we've had some focused areas of discussion this morning on some research areas. What my goal here in the next uh, 20 minutes or so is to talk about a number of different research projects and kind of set up the afternoon as well. The first one I want to talk about is a, is a fellowship project that Elanco uh, helped sponsor with our group and Larissa Becker uh, provided the primary uh, leadership with this. Uh, there's a lot of questions in terms of you know, using Skysis like all other additives. Where is the benefit? What is the response? What we were basically tasked with in this particular uh, meta-analysis was to take all available data that we could get, both the published and then some of the information Elanco had generated, develop an easy to use producer tool or nutritionist tool for anybody to know where the benefit's going to lie when using it at different points of time, different parameters in. And really what we want to get to, again this is on our website currently under our tool section, Ultimately, what did we find with this particular uh, uh, meta-analysis? From an average daily gain, depending on the parameters that are used and length and dose, all those things, an improvement in average daily gain just over 1 to 1.65%, a feed conversion 0.71 to 0.17. So again, depending on the parameters and, and things, the inputs, how you would use it would influence that, as well as an improvement in carcass yield when fed longer than 65 days. So again, uh, just this tool is available on our website as part of your decision-making process with this particular product. Dr. Uh, Hilario Cordoba was, is part of our team. He's from Argentina. He's uh, working on his PhD. One of the things that he has helped us with, uh, uh, Dr. Jose Sato, when he was a part of our grad program, he worked on an energy calculator that then was used by the industry to help make decisions on different diet energy levels and trying to optimize that based on performance. Hilario took that calculator and we worked with uh, PIC as part of their fellowship that they have with us to basically update and bring in additional data and improve that model robust robustness. And so this is also, this will be put on our, there was a workshop yesterday uh, that we hosted here with a number of people that dove into this. This will be on our website uh, probably next week. And, uh, and we'll just have, again, there's different inputs. We're not going to get in the weeds of it, but basically it allows you to look at your current diet energy levels, put in new energy levels and ranges for each of the phases that you would potentially use, put in the diet cost, and it'll help output maybe that optimal energy level during those different phases of time based on current conditions. So again, a really valuable tool that we'll uh, have up and available uh, in the very near future for you to use. And again, encourage if you have questions on that and the inputs, sure get a hold of our group and we can help. To tie into the energy discussion, we recently did a, a study in combination with, uh, with PIC as well as our partners at the Swine Vet Center where we help with some of the, the research management there. What I wanted to set up here is what we wanted to do was look at a wide range of energy in finishing utilizing a couple different ingredients that are lower in energy and what we have here is this is just the phase one diet there's five phases that were fed but we're all set up in a similar fashion really what I want you to go to is on this net energy reduction we had different uh, we'll get to the treatments on the next slide but we basically had a corn soy diet as the high energy highest energy and then we had a diet with 25 percent wheat mids 15 percent corn distiller grains as the low energy and in that, there was about an 8% reduction in net energy. We formulated those in a lysine calorie ratio, okay? Again, met all other nutrients in the diet. So we fed that over five phases. And what we wanted to do then was characterize the feed efficiency growth a lot. There's a lot more uh, information that I'm going to be able to present today. But what I want to point out is as we went, reduced energy from, from, from the zero down to reduced it by 8%, feed conversion went up about 13 percent. So about for every point of energy reduction was about a point and a half loss of feed conversion. Okay, So currently we understand we're, you know, we're not going to focus on 
where our industry is today. We understand the economic pressure we're under. We, you know, whether we're in good times or we're in times like this, we're always optimizing diets, but you know, right now in particular, looking at should how low of energy, how can we lower the input cost of the operations. Um, we have to make sure that we're understanding where our points are of return. And again, everybody deals with this. Energy is the most complex and yet most important thing that we formulate in these diets. We want to make sure we're trying to make sure we're predicting what's going to happen from these diets. If we look at final body weight, okay, this is about an 8% change uh, or 7% change with a reduction in net energy up to about an eight, again, the diets decreased by 8%. So again, about a 1% change in average daily gain with the ingredients used for every percent decrease in net energy of the diet. So we recognize feed conversion gets worse. In this case, commercial facilities gain went down as well. And we, they, those pigs could not just simply eat more to keep their gain. And you can see that the body weight, final body weight. Now that's a combination of both loss of gain, but also the classical response of yield. Again, this isn't anything new. This is information we've worked on for a long time, others as well, understanding if you keep pigs on a high fiber diet until they go to slaughter, we're going to give up yield. And this is a, this is a data that clearly shows that as we had more fiber in the diet, we just continued to lose yield as those pigs were fed all the way to market. Now we know practically many of us, most people in that last diet, what do we do? We reduce, or in some cases we've been removing, especially if it's summer, now we probably have a little bit more fiber in that last diet to moderate the yield loss or to improve growth through some energy in that last phase. But again, understand that that yield it continues to uh, time and time again show its head if we reduce the amount or still carry a high level of fiber all the way to market. The next two slides there's a lot on. These will be probably the most two complicated slides I have and uh, we'll, we'll spend just a brief amount of time talking through because one of the most important things we can do as nutritionists is make sure that we're valuing ingredients correctly. I'm pretty sure Wayne this afternoon in his talk, and this may come up about six times, all right? Valuing ingredients correctly. That's what the next two slides are really about. On this particular slide, this is the database value. So if we were to go to the NRC, INRA, which is the French group, CBV, which is the Dutch tables, and the Brazilian tables, they all have standard published values for energy of ingredients. Okay? That can be a starting point. If we take those based on the database, what I want you to first focus on in the blue line is the NRC, and in the green line is the CBV. Okay? Both of those had a linear increase, and this is caloric efficiency, okay, caloric efficiency. If the ingredient values of a publication are all 100% correct, or the pigs agreed with what those values are, that line should be flat. So it shouldn't matter what the feed conversion change was, it's how we're valuing the ingredients, okay. Both of those in the blue, which is, a, which is more pronounced, but the green as well went up uh, in a linear fashion, which means we actually have a higher energy value of those diets than what, the, what actually happened. Okay? So somewhere in there, now recognize we have corn, soybean meal, distillers, and mids. They're all meshed together. So it could be one or more of those are in combinations. But what it says is just using those as our benchmark, we're probably just not going to be 100% accurate on that prediction. Now, in the purple, or I'm sorry, yeah, Brazilians in the purple, you look at that line from the left to the right, there's a little bit of change with no statistical difference. So that doesn't necessarily mean every value is right, but the combination of those ingredients showed it actually would predict that energy response very well. On the flip side for INRA, as the red goes down, that means that we don't have, a, that we undervalued those in, uh, uh, diets or ingredient values where they were lower than what was actually done, okay? So on the flip side, if we actually take the ingredients, do proximate analysis, different groups have equations that we can predict the energy value of each ingredient. And this would be a little bit more common that's done, all right? So we're going to do a nutrient analysis, we do some predictions, okay? What this shows is, again, it, it, in, in this case we have the NRC, we have the NRC on a DE basis, INRA and CBV. Again, what we can see is in red, the, the DE of NRC, as well as in purple, okay, 
The purple line, which is the CBV, they are linear increases. So again, it means that they actually, based on those book values, still gave us too high a value. All right. Again, we want flat values. And so again, a lot going on here. There's some, you know, a couple of them went down, so those values weren't as high as they should have been if the pigs would have read the book or everything matched. So again, the valuing of ingredients is one of the toughest things that we do, but it's probably absolutely the most important thing we can do to make accurate diets. All, lots of you work on that all the time. We do it in production. We're trying to get better through some of this research as well. Okay? Going to switch gears completely uh, and talk about some vitamins on the next couple studies. The first study that Larissa Becker helped us with was looking at folic acid in nursery diets. Now, folic acid is a B vitamin that's in all sow diets. It's a routine sow uh, addition to uh, that vitamin pack. Not always as common. There are some in nursery pigs, little less in finishing that's added. But there was some data out of Asia. And again, before you start looking at data, what I want to kind of focus down here on levels first. So the reason we did this study is there was some data out of Asia recently that showed increasing levels of folic acid up to 18 parts per million actually improved growth performance in nursery pigs. For reference, in most sow diets, we have two to four parts per million folic acid from Dr. Jamil Fasin's survey. And then in the nursery stage, there's many, uh, we had an industry survey many of you participated in. We got about 60% of the U.S. swine in that survey that we published last year at this swine day. In the nursery period, in the first two stages, it's about four, four to six part per million on average, and then it goes down to two in the latter. But there is some production systems that are using 20 in that first, two, first week or two in the nursery stage of folic acid. So there's a wide range, but again, memory, Sow diets are going to be one or two to four, roughly, and that's kind of where the industry averages are because they're adding it too. The data I want to take from here is we went from, this was a combination of folic acid and zinc oxide. That Asian paper did that combination and, and basically tried to conclude you can use higher folic acid to replace zinc oxide. Okay? We wanted to replicate that here. And what we found, if we just look at folic acid first, whether independent of zinc oxide, what we see is that there was a quadratic response. In fact, when we went from 0 to 20, we had a, a decrease in performance, and then it came back up at 40. And where this is important, I'm going to show another study that shows this same thing. We're like, why does this make sense? And I'll be honest, we don't know why at 20 it goes down and 40 back up, but we've done it twice, and I'll get to that data. Um, and then we had a zinc oxide response, uh, gave us our typical average daily gain growth with no interactions. Interestingly, why did we have less gain? It was a feed intake response. Actually, at that 20 parts per million folic acid, pigs had a reduced average daily gain versus that at 40. Again, can't completely explain that, but again, we're, we'll show some data that we confirm that as well. So uh, again, what we need to be looking at, just because some vitamins are low cost, we need to make sure we're using reasonable levels to meet requirements. We start going to high levels without much data, we can maybe be getting ourselves in a little bit of trouble. On the zinc oxide was part of this, and so again, I'll, I'll give a shout out because the grad students, I don't know how many feces collections there's been in the last year, but it's a, it's a lot, right? So we've got to have at least one feces slide. Um, in this particular slide, what I really want to get to, there was nothing in the way of folic acid. Again, zinc oxide, why do we use zinc oxide? If we look at the firm uh, stools, again, in, in the zinc oxide, if you just look at numbers, we had the zinc oxide had the highest. Look at diarrhea in the purple. When we fed zinc oxide, we have the lowest amount of purple. Um, that, that's a, uh, less diarrhea. So again, got the zinc oxide response in that. So we wanted to follow that up because, oh, also to quickly point out, part of the reason we wanted to do a follow-up is in this particular study, and this was done at K-State here at the, SC, at the SCW, we had approximately 10% death loss at the 20 and it was about seven and a half at the 40, and z zero death loss on the zero. So we're in we have normal stuff, but there was nothing particular, but just markedly high death loss, which is highly unusual uh, for this type of study. Okay? So we wanted to follow up to that. We did another study titrating from zero to 40, and a little cleaner type of titration. Again, in this particular case, a linear reduction in average daily gain going out to day 38 in the nursery. 
again, if you remember my initial comments, there's a lot of people that are adding somewhere around two to four. So we're down in this range. One, per, one or two production systems are adding 20. So we need to make sure that we understand maybe some of these impacts. And again, what's interesting, down to 20, then 40 came back up, just like that first study. Again, not sure why, but that's what's happened. Again, on feed intake driven response, they simply, just by including more folic acid, drove feed intake down. Pretty fascinating, okay? Again, not fully sure why that is the case. And feed conversion, again, uh, as we look at there's a quadratic effect. As we got to those higher levels, feed conversion got worse, okay? So again, we just wanted to present some in new information on that folic acid area, something that certainly doesn't receive a lot of attention, but we're really intrigued with some of those results. The next area I want to talk about is, some, is vitamin E. Uh, uh, Johnson, recent PhD student, uh, finished up this uh, last year. Uh, he worked on a project looking at vitamin E equivalents compared to synthetic vitamin E. So before you get to all the bars, it's easier to set it up here at the bottom. First treatment, sorry this light isn't very bright, had contained 15 parts per million vitamin E. What is the requirement? So I think this is a good lesson for all of us in nutrition and a lot of vets in the front row, Paul. No, but like we got to remember what the requirement for vitamin E is in a starter pig. It's 16 parts per million in the NRC, 16. Okay, the current industry study for the first two phases, the industry average feeding vitamin E is right now 80 to 90 parts per million, and then it's 45 from basically a 25 to 50 pound pig. Okay, so industry average for what it's worth, that's where we're at. This study was set up with 15 at NRC. It was set up, we then had a level increase to 75 parts per million of synthetic vitamin E as a positive control. We then included uh, uh, cabion, uh, and basically it's a, it's a polyphenol compound. It's extracted from grapes, nuts, citrus, has a lot of antioxidant properties and has been looked at. There's some data out of Europe, and it's used as a, as a partial substitute or use in combination with certain levels of vitamin E to achieve a, a, a target vitamin E level on equivalence basis. So what we did is we had two treatments that, uh, that we wanted to balance to the 75 equivalents. And we did that through two different combinations of straight vitamin E and increasing levels of uh, cabion. Then we also had the level of 557. Basically, this is the level after you score a touchdown and spike. You want a high number. Uh, we just wanted, they wanted a high level in there to see if there's any toxicity, any issues from feeding a very high level if that ever became a case. We just didn't have data in that area. So what I want to show on an average daily gain basis, no differences in treatment as we go across, uh, really in this particular case from 15, again, equivalents on 75 um, or 575. On feed conversion, there was no uh, treatment differences, but there was a linear effect as we tail from 15, the average of the 75, and then to the 575, uh, uh, an improvement in feed conversion as we did feed or offer more total E equivalents. One of the things that's measured in why do we feed higher levels? Yeah, I'm talking too much. All right, so why do we feed more vitamin E than the 15 baseline? It's to provide extra antioxidant status in those pigs. And what we did is we measured serum SDO activity. That is an antioxidant enzyme that really is, shows a status and it has the potential help with free radicals, improve immunity in the, in the body of that pig. What we did find in this particular case, a linear increase, but what, what we really want to point out is there was a step up from 15 to 75, and then it was flat across all of those, so no better, no worse. And then we had the slight improvement up once we put the high level in. So again, just wanted to present some new information that we worked with on that area. The next quick area was, uh, is, is looking at some protein and lactose sources of nursery diets that Ethan worked on as well. In this particular study, the goal was, was to evaluate fish, fish solubles. Fish solubles, what that is, it's a liquid product. So when you extract fish oil out of the fish uh, processing, you're left with a water product that still contains some fat, soluble protein and vitamins. So that's fish solubles. It's from the extraction of fish oil. They can add that back to fish meal or they have that available to add to other products. Really what I want to point out here is we had a study with different protein sources. We added fish solubles either to the Mepro product 
or to fish meal directly. It did not have any changes. We had some uh, protein source effects. But what was concerning is when we added it here, why did we have a reduction? It didn't make sense based on some initial data. We went and followed up on a second experiment with the group. And, it, and when we mixed the fish solubles with fish meal, again, no differences that we saw in that case. But we also didn't see any benefits. So really the take home from this was while that fish solubles product uh, does have some nutritional value, we were not able to improve growth performance of pigs. And in one case, in that first day, we had a reduction. But that was, uh, we're not sure exactly why that would occur. Ethan also worked, uh, we had a project with International Ingredients and, and appreciate their support of the program. Uh, we did at New Horizon Farms looking at targeted lactose levels. And so we had target lactose intake levels of 1.6 pounds of lactose or 0.8 pounds of lactose. So this equivalented to 20% lactose or 10% lactose in two different diets in phase one and 10% lactose and 4% lactose in phase two for the high and low to achieve these target intake levels. As we look across, and also we want to look at different forms of the, uh, the, you know, the Dairy Lac 80 versus a spray dried. Again, saw no differences in form, and we didn't necessarily pick up much of an average daily gain response, but as we look at feed intake, we're able to find a feed intake level response for those pigs offered more lactose during that uh, 21 day period where they had higher feed intake, very classical lactose response, no differences between sources or the types of how it was dried. Um, and so again, just some information generated there. Whew, last, that was it for data for this morning, all right? So we're gonna wrap up with a few slides. Um, looking at first, just wanna make sure we point out our, our K-State, uh, KSU Swine website. This is the hub for all of our information, uh, our producer tools, uh, all the swine days that are, that are published, to not only this year, but going back decades are all available at that site. Uh, we also have a number of other uh, resources available, and that's all at, at ksuswine.org. Want to plug our profitability conference. So we do two uh, adult education public events, I like to refer to them. One is obviously today. The other one is our swine profitability conference in February. Our speaker lineup is up here as such. Uh, Steve, if you don't know Steve Myers retiring this next year, uh, we want to make sure we had him part of the program. He's been a great supporter to our industry. Um, and hopefully he'll, he'll have better news in February than he's had the last couple months. Uh, we also have the NBAF speaker that's going to talk about the capabilities of NBAF up on the hill, the new Plum Island that's getting fired up. Um, from Iowa State, we'll have a, a diagnostic review of what the latest clinical pathogens and diseases and trends. Uh, we'll have a talk on that. Brian Humphreys, the CEO of National Pork Producers Council, we're really honored to have him in. Uh, we've been trying to get them in for a couple years, and he was able to make it work. So we'll get a national perspective on our, on our, our pork industry as well as we always highlight and want to have at least one Kansas producer. And this year, Dan from the J6 Farms is going to talk about their family story and their business, how that's grown and developed over time. So we're excited for that. A couple last things. Um, first off, if you look at the picture on the left, it does show that it actually does rain in Kansas, okay, with the green. Uh, we're not sure the last time that was. But this is a picture of our K-State Swine Farm. If we look at how much research, I mean, this is just, again, we are so fortunate, K-State, to have our livestock units basically a mile from our campus uh, from a teaching research perspective. And we fight really hard to keep them, and we keep building, and, and we'll be able to sustain that for a long time. Um, and one of the things we want to talk about is some different projects we have going on. This is a, uh, how weather changes, right? No green grass. So if we look at our farm and how it's evolved over time, um, again, when I showed up here, this is my 26 swine day, I was counting. When I showed up here, this was all outdoor pigs in the back and up here in the front. Everything's gotten pulled inside with modernizing facilities over time. Uh, two years ago, we built a new farrowing house. It's just been a blessing here for us. Actually, yesterday, I was looking in the notes. They did approve. Uh, uh, so we're going to do a new building project at the farm. For those that are familiar with the old grower, this was the old fairing house in a nursery we still have rocking and rolling. Uh, those are going to get tore down this spring or summer, and we're going to build a new nursery similar to the one we built in 14. The other exciting thing I want to mention is, is in our, we have a, a finisher barn called the Old West Barn. It's on the west side, so we're very creative in naming. Um, 
it was used for a lot of discovery research. We're going to be in the process of remodeling and changing that whole barn to a BSL-2, where we're going to uh, have its own entry, own showers, kind of make that isolated on the farm, and be able to do uh, different disease challenge work right there. So opportunities we're really excited about, and Jordan is helping lead up that effort. So again, is what we're, we're at is we're in the process of, of, of building that new facility and we like to talk about how that comes together because there's a lot of generous support of different groups that help us. This new nursery facility is just going to be short of a million dollars. Our LMIC uh, group, which is a foundation group of, of livestock producers, have donated 100000 Kansas Pork has always been generous. Our Kansas producers continue to thank you for the support. They've pledged money to help with different equipment. The Board of Regents yesterday approved 200000 for the teardown of the old buildings. And then the other just over half a million is being funded internally through gifts, uh, through some of our research projects, different things that we're able to put that together. So we're really excited about that. A couple new people. So for almost 40 years, and last year we talked about Lois Schreiner was our events coordinator. She was the one that took care of all of you all the time and took care of us all the time. Uh, she retired this last year. We hired Katie Smith. Katie was the face you uh, interacted with on all the emails. Uh, she's the one, along with our team, that helped get you registered. Uh, she helps us with our events, not only Swine, but across the department. We're really excited about what she's bringing, and we're uh, very fortunate. So when you see her, make sure you welcome her to the group. The other couple hires we've had this year is uh, Dr. Peyton Dahmer. Uh, Peyton is, was a, a PhD did his work, grad work here, worked with Cassie Jones, myself, Chad, and Jordan were also on his graduate committee. He did a lot of swine research in a variety of areas, helped a lot with the undergrad research program. He has a lot of talents on the youth livestock side and as well as judging. So for many of you, Chris Mullinex had been our livestock judging coach for the last many years. Uh, Chris just finished his last team at Louisville this week and uh, we've hired Peyton uh, to come on and faculty and he'll be taking over the livestock judging team. And then also with his pig side, well, I'm sure we'll be able to tap into him plenty there as well. The other thing, and this is really the, we let, uh, this is really the first time that this is, is being announced. And so uh, we have been working, we've been having been in discussions the last couple years about how do we expand our team. Uh, we've been fortunate over time to be able to refill some positions. Just over 10 years ago, we were able to hire Jason Woodworth. Uh, he was in the industry, came back on soft funding and, and the college and department help with that now. We need to grow, continue to grow capacity and fresh people and fresh thoughts in our swine group. So I guess we're really pleased to announce that we have, uh, we're expanding our faculty group in animal science. Uh, we're able to hire uh, Caitlin Gaffield. Caitlin is, uh, we are so excited to have somebody come on board and, and with Caitlin's talents and in her background to work side by side on the faculty side. Once she finishes in February, she'll start her uh, employment as a faculty member in, uh, in March. And then she'll begin the process of working with many of you in the industry on research, advising grad students, all the things that we do on our team. So we're really excited to be able to add to a faculty member and expand our reach and capabilities here at K-State. 